Tonight, all about dermatology. Our skin is a wonderful organ, but often needs care and protection. The doctors are on call now. Funding for this program is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by... The South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Regional Health, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System and Fishback Financial Corporation. There's the, the bell. And which was healthier, the yogurt and the bagel? I'm going to start by measuring the size of it. You could also add grilled chicken to this recipe. Whoa, 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 keep pushing. Just your head. Pull red handle to open bag. Welcome to On Call. Our topic for this evening is about foot or scalp skin infections, acne, or anything to do with dermatology. Skin is the unsung hero of the body. It's our largest organ by weight at six to nine pounds and covers about two square yards in an average sized adult. The skin accomplishes an amazing job protecting the inside of our bodies from the outer world. It keeps us from drying out, it regulates our body temperature, it protects us from the infections, and it is the part of the body that portrays our feelings, our age, our character. The skin stretches into a smile when we are amused and all those other expressions as we charge through life experiences. But like every other organ, the skin can become irritated, inflamed, burned, traumatized, and infected. Unlike hidden organs like the brain or the pancreas, the skin usually tells us when something is wrong. I invite you to call in tonight. Right now, our, uh, we're uh, sometime over the next one hour, give us our call, your calls or questions about skin problems. The phone number is 1-888-376-6225. That's 1-888-376-6225. Although there are very high-tech tools using special blood tests and microscopes and stains, still the most important diagnostic tool of the physician dermatologist is her or his eyes, assisted by light touch. The experienced dermatologist who has seen in vivo, in life, not just in books, the world of dermatology is indeed a valuable person and an asset to our society. We have just that kind of guy tonight, Dr. Jim McGran, a dermatologist and Mohs surgeon from Dakota Dermatology of Sioux Falls. Welcome, Jim. Hi, Rick, good to be here. So you've been here, I don't know, what, 20, 30, 40 times before? <laughs> to, well, it seems like that often, through the but probably, probably not that often, but yes. You're uh, a dermatologist. Now, that means that exclusively you just do dermatology, or do you do other things? Well, my primary of, of uh, expertise is that of a skin cancer specialist. And so as dermatologists, a lot of things we see will be uh, various skin cancers, basal cell skin cancer, squamous cell skin cancer, melanoma. And so that's my specific area of expertise, but choosing to live in South Dakota meant that I was also going to be a dermatologist. So I don't just do skin cancer, I do general dermatology as well, which is the evaluation treatment of various skin conditions. And as a South Dakota physician, you sometimes have to treat the patient, not just the skin. And so that means occasionally you have to use your brain and treat things other than just the skin. I was thinking about this today. Um, as we, I was thinking about the reunion. You and I both went to our 40th or 41st college uh, reunion. Mm -hmm. And what a joy to see great friends. And, and by the way, one of them asked me 
why do they call you gutsy? Do you know? You know why that is? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. Yeah, is the old story. Yeah. Uh, it goes back to a rather uh, a strange activity as a young man. Yeah, oh, so and, well, and I've managed to live it down. There yeah. you have it. Well, uh, but you you have uh, you came back as a Mohs surgeon. I wanted uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you though about the emotions of the people that you uh, care for. I know that. I bet you 60% of what I do is, uh, has a lot to, to do with what's, or more, with what's turning and churning inside of them uh, emotionally, and making everything else worse and so on. How much of what happens on the skin could be related to? Um, a lot, and, and a lot of what I deal with as a cancer specialist is to put that person at ease because a lot of times people come into you with an expectation of this is it. I've got cancer and everybody knows when you hear the C word, that's it, you're done. And skin cancer is a different story. This is a condition where the vast majority of times a simple procedure can cure that individual. They can go on and have a good life and not be changed or altered by it. And you know, with current treatments and the steps that we've taken, dermatologists, plastic surgeons and, and cancer surgeons in general, we've been able to not only eradicate the cancer but do so in a way that doesn't mutilate the patient. But when a patient comes in to us, a lot of times they, they don't really know what's gonna happen. And so the first thing they're concerned about is, am I gonna live? And then you explain, yes, you are gonna live, you're gonna do well. The next thing is, is it gonna hurt? And then you have to kind of put the, uh, lay their fears that this is a pretty simple procedure, we can do it pretty well, you're not gonna have a lot of problems and you'll be out of here in good shape. So you have to take care of the whole patient too. Yeah, you? put their mind to rest because that's the biggest issue. We already have a question from uh, Brookings. My child had a reaction to minocycline, which is an antibiotic, causing severe joint pain. How often do you see this? Well, there, there is a rare reaction to minocycline, which is a, it's like a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and it's a, what they used to call a lupus-like reaction. And it's something that we used to see fairly frequently about 10 years ago, and in my mind, that condition seemed to be related to a generic form of minocycline that we're not seeing very often anymore. So it rarely happens, and of course the issue is, if you have these things and you go into your doctor, it's critical that when you go in, you explain to them everything they've been doing. Talk about the medications, bring in your medication list, what are the pills you take that are prescriptions, what's over the counter, what are the multivitamins, because you know, if the doctor doesn't know what you're taking, they can't make that diagnosis. And minocycline is one of the drugs that can do this, but there are other drugs that can do it as well. The frustration with the minocycline reaction is that it's not like a typical allergic reaction where you stop the drug and 10 days later the rash is gone. These kinds of things, this juvenile rheumatoid-like reaction, can sometimes go on for several months even after you stop the drug. Even if it's due to the minocycline? Even if it's due to minocycline. So do you treat it with uh, steroid bursts? And Usually you're gonna treat it like an arthritis. So first thing is stop the drug, and if it's significant, we get the help of a rheumatologist uh, but the majority of them can be treated with mild anti-arthritic drugs, uh, Advil, uh, Motrin, ibuprofen type meds like that. Um, and a big part of it is reassuring them that it's not a serious illness. All right. Well, On Call visited with Owen Stanley, South Dakota State University's Assistant Athlete Director for Sports Medicine about managing skin problems that may occur while athletes are training. A lot of skin conditions that we typically find uh, usually are staph infections. Um, we do get that a couple of times just based on wounds that uh, end up getting a little bit more serious and those staph infections could lead to MRSA if they're not handled properly. Um, and again, that's, that starts at our level and then we go and, and uh, pursue physicians to get antibiotics and all the, all the right medications to help prevent some of that and uh, take treat and take care of some of that. Uh, then we also run into things like ringworm with, uh, more often with wrestlers, um, and that, that is a fungal infection. And again, we go to physicians to get the proper cream and, and uh, medications for that to get rid of that. And sometimes we do treat that prophylactically as well in case we know that there might be an outbreak or they were at a tournament somewhere else outside of our area that, that uh, had an outbreak. A lot of reasons why people get skin infections is just for, you know, just cleanliness. Um, bacteria is obviously all around us all the time. It's on our skin. 
So with athletics, you know, you're rubbing up against each other. People are rubbing and sweating down on a mat or on their jersey. Um, in, the, in the community, you do it all over. In the fitness centers, you know, they use a piece of equipment. They get sweat and some of their bacteria on that area. Um, and then somebody comes along and uses it right afterwards without having it wiped down. And what it does is it just kind of gets in, in underneath your dermal layer. In regards to suggestions for battling uh, getting infected um, with athletics, it, it's all about cleanliness, making sure you wipe down pieces of equipment uh, that you use, wipe down mats after a wrestling practice, uh, making sure our athletes take showers after practice and get cleaned really well with soap. Uh, making sure they're washing their hair, everything like that. And then staying on them also to, to just wash their hands throughout the day. Try to stay away from touching their nose, their eyes, you know, their mouth, things like that. Um, and then for general community, it, it's a lot of the same things actually. It's, it's making sure that you wipe down maybe a piece of equipment even before you go on it. Uh, just so you know that it, it's clean before you use it. Uh, as well as wipe down afterwards. Again, washing your hands thoroughly all the time as, as much as you can. Uh, especially again during those winter months and and as well uh, taking showers after you work out. When you're looking at gyms or, or looking at uh, schools just make sure that uh, you see things are, are getting cleaned. Uh, especially community gyms there are a lot of them are having alcohol based wipes everywhere that that people can use so you look for something like that. Um, if you see anything that is dirty make sure you report it uh, to the community fitness members um, and or the, the facility workers and then when you're when you're dealing with athletics, you know, just just be wise. Ask that question on your recruiting trip or, or whatever it might be. Uh, if you come into the athletic training room, all the athletic trainers will be able to tell you yeah, what they do practice it. wise on on making sure we prevent infections like that. That's interesting. So, uh, Jim, you the, he talked about uh, keeping the mats clean and and so on and so forth and how important it was that the guys shower and everything. How important is the cleanliness of the athlete? Well, that's an interesting thing because what's kind of a strange thing is bathing regularly doesn't prevent infection. The real thing that prevents infection is maintenance of the barrier. In other words, your skin has a layer, a barrier on it, and that's what protects us. That keeps away the poisons that touch our skin every day. It takes away the various uh, infectious materials. And really, people get infected not because they didn't wash or didn't bathe routinely. Or they, they, they have a problem because they get a breakdown in the barrier function. If you have an abrasion, if you have a cut, if you have a nick. If you think about people getting athlete's foot, they get it because they got a cut or nick in the skin and that creates an access point for the infection to come on. So I agree with everything that he just said, but in terms of personal care, it's equally important to use a gentle cleanser to clean the skin. You know, obviously you wanna be clean because obviously you smell funny, people aren't gonna talk to you. But then it's also important to use nice, gentle, light moisturizers. And so in this day and age, I tell people, you bet, go ahead and bathe regularly because people don't like you if you smell. But after you do that bathing, use a light moisturizer. And what I recommend routinely nowadays are light moisturizers that are what called ceramide based. And ceramides are very light oils that are available in multiple different brands of moisturizers. Uh, the Aveeno brand has it. Uh, there's a new one called CeraVe, Old Fashioned Cetaphil, and Curel. All these lotions have this ceramide moisturizer. You can go to your pharmacist and ask for these products. They're light, they're easy to apply, they're very elegant to have on, and the nice part is they're inexpensive. But if you put a barrier on the skin, you're protecting the skin, you're going to reduce your chance for infection. And so I tell people, sure, bathe, but next step, get that moisturizer and get the barrier on the skin protected. What about the gentle cleanser? What, what is that? What well, uh, one of the things is if you're 15 and you want to use Irish Spring, that's great. But unfortunately, once you start to get a little older, the body isn't replacing that oil as routinely. And so one of the issues is once you start to break into that plus 40, plus 50 age, you need to start getting away from the strong deodorant soaps and using gentle type cleansers, things like Dove, or any of the uh, cleansers that you'll see because a cleanser literally cleans the skin, removes the dirt, but doesn't take the oil away. 
Soap, by definition, saponifies. And saponifying means to remove the oils well, from the skin. So when you're using Dial or Safeguard or Irish Spring, these are all deodorant soaps. And they are extremely efficient at not only removing that dirt, they remove the oil. And that's that barrier that protects you. So, so, you, so you stay like with Dove. it. What's, what's another inexpensive? Dove is a good one. I like to go to the store and pick the pretty one or what's on sale. Neutrogena makes good products, Oil of Olay makes good products, Cetaphil, Purpose, CeraVe. Um, I'm a cheapskate, so usually my choice is what's on sale, but I'm picking what's called a cleanser, not a soap. And so that, you know, and if you're not sure, ask for that. Yeah, yeah I, you know, you, you, we just made a point of, uh, he was saying keep clean and make sure that you wash your hands so that you don't spread illness. And of course, I'm the big fan of washing your hands, but uh, the problem is you break your your barrier down as you overdo it and your hands turn cracked and broken and w wide open for infection. Uh, I, I've, I've particularly liked using the uh, alcohol-based, uh, 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 what are they called, the bacterial? Antibacterial cleansers. cleansers. Yeah, yeah. What do you think of those? Well, used in moderation, they're okay, but one of the problems we encountered early on in the hospitals, you know, 15 years ago we ran into a huge influx of people that were allergic to latex because they were wearing gloves and doing things and we, we did a big study on this and basically we discovered that there were a couple of issues. One is that extremely strong cleansers were removing that barrier and making people more prone to, inf to infection, more prone to allergy and then the second thing was the powder itself. So getting rid of the powder in the latex gloves reduced that. Uh, 15 years ago, 5% of the hospital personnel were allergic to latex. Today, it's less than one half percent because we've gone to gentle cleansers, moisturizers routinely, and getting rid of the powder in the latex gloves. Well, and, and you know, I like washing the hands, particularly when you're dealing with people who have a diarrhea illness, because those uh, alcohol-based cleansers do not um, do not protect. They do well with the respiratory, but not with the GI. But uh, when you're washing so much and you have bad hands, that's a tough scenario. We have a question. My daughter has excessive sweating. Special deodorants are not working. What can they do? Well, when you look at this, what do dermatologists call this hyperhidrosis? And generally you it's look excessive at sweating. excessive, excessive perspiration and you want to define where it is. If it's in the armpits, which most people, there are specific treatments. Occasionally it's on the hands, sometimes it's on the feet. Hopefully it's not general, which is a bigger problem. The first thing we always start with is that you, you talk about deodorants and then you talk about antiperspirants. A deodorant simply kills bacteria and keeps you from smelling. Most of the products you're using are actually uh, antiperspirants and these are products that are something like aluminum chloride that when you put them on, they go into the sweat gland, they shrink it down and they reduce perspiration. So when you look at the average product that you buy in the store today, it's an antiperspirant slash deodorant, primarily an antiperspirant, and they have either aluminum chloride or some similar product, and usually about a half percent. If you go up to the stronger ones, they might be 1%, 2%. You can get up to some that are up to 4%. That's where most people get. If you get to where those aren't working, then the next step is go see your doctor. He can prescribe a 5% aluminum chloride product or a 20% aluminum chloride product. If that's not working, then you're probably going to need to come and see me because then I'm going to talk to you about products that we can use like Botox injections that will take away the perspiration for six months or uh, ionophoresis devices that can work for it. And even in rare cases, there are surgeries that can be done. But all of these have to be put in perspective. But I've seen people get into a lot of trouble with the, the spray deodorants in particular. They spray down and then they come in with big rashes where they've been putting on that deodorant. Especially, you know, there are big, they're big issues with this and that, you know, we've got this feeling about you have to smell good. And so we're using uh, fragrances and of course, if you put a fragrance on an irritated area, there's a big risk for infection. So what I tell people is, if you've got an issue with perspiration, start out with, if you can, go unscented because you don't need a fragrance to not smell. And, there's, and they're unscented. Deodorant. Yeah, they're unscented products there. Product. The other thing is, when you look at where you need an antiperspirant, the, the antiperspirant only needs to be applied basically where the hair grows in the armpit. So you don't need to slather it all over the whole area. You need to be very specific 
And actually, antiperspirants work better if you apply it the night before rather than the morning of because they need to get into the sweat gland and shrink it down. So, you know, what, what would work better? Well, start out by putting your antiperspirant on at night. Wow, haven't heard that one. Rash on the neck where sunlight does not reach. Should I use a UV light? If so, what kind? Rash on the neck, UV light. What well, uh, UV lights are not really going to help an average rash, and so that wouldn't be my first start. The first thing I'd say is, well, if you've got a rash on the neck, something's causing it. And so it can be an infection, uh, ringworm, bacterial infection. More typically, it's going to be, what are you putting on your neck? So the first thing I'd want to know is, what are you using for fragrance? Because the most for common sure. reason for a rash on the neck fragrance you're putting on the skin. Well, and then necklaces, sometimes this cheaper uh, necklace. Metal, inexpensive uh, jewelry, you know, when most people go to the store, they're not buying 14 karat gold, and so there's a substantial amount of nickel in there. 10% of adult women with pierced ears are now allergic to nickel. And if you're buying inexpensive oh, wow. jewelry, it has nickel. On call, visited with Dr. Merritt Warren with Avera Medical Group Brookings about three skin infections that athletes may encounter. We begin with his comments about MAT-induced herpes simplex. One of the things we see with athletes is um, basically three different infections. One is viral, one is um, fungal, and one was bacterial. So we see uh, viral just being what is called MAT herpes or herpes gladiatorium, uh, where generally wrestlers will get this and uh, it's a problem of, of spreading skin to skin contact. Uh, usually it's, it's a herpes, so it's a simplex type 1 herpes, so it's related to the one that causes cold sores on the lip, but it, it appears more on the skin, um, face, arms, um, trunk. A little, it'll show up as little um, group of vesicles or little fluid filled little um, uh, grouping of what are called vesicles or just little blister type of appearance grouping of three or four or five of them. It's contagious for about five days no matter what you do um, so treatment is more for symptom relief. Um, typical cold sore we can use medication it's either topical or oral medication one called Valtrex that can be given by mouth or acyclovir gel or cream that you put on it topically. Uh, you just need to treat it till it's, it's no longer weeping, then it's not contagious anymore. The other thing that we do with athletes with the mat herpes is during the season, we just put them on prophylactic medicine. All the athletic trainers are well trained now what to look for, so if they see it, they, they just really keep them out of competition. And before all tournaments, they have skin checks, so they they have to visibly inspect all the athletes. With the mad herpes, you know, they've also um, found it in rugby players, um, but that would be the biggest thing would be in wrestlers. So that's wrestlers herpes simplex. That's interesting now. Where else does herp herpes simplex occur? Well, herpes is a, a type one herpes type virus that's an inoculation of the skin. We see it in wrestlers. We see it in boyfriend and girlfriends. We see it routinely passed from family member to family member because we talk about fomites. This is a, a condition where if you put the virus in the right place and you've got a nick or cut in the skin, you've got the virus. So they used to talk about it, kissing disease in teenagers because one child with a cold sore kisses another person. They got a nick or scratch, they got a cold sore. But it can happen on the hands, it can happen anywhere where there's a nick or cut. And uh, so, so that's the issue. Well, that's, they, they should do a lot of hand washing on that one, right? Hand washing is good. And, you know, basic uh, common sense. If you got a cold sore, don't, don't be kissing anybody. Yeah. yeah. Well, what about, and then people can get herpes simplex, a different kind in, in the vagina at, or in the labia so, or in the penis. As a sexually transmitted disease. Right. Yeah. And what, how is that treated? Well, tr typically with those, you're going to treat them in an initial using something called Valtrex. And, uh, in the early days, we had a drug called Zovirex, and the pharmacists are still somewhat enamored with it because it was less expensive, but it's not a very effective drug. Nowadays, Valtrex is the drug of choice because it's a generic drug, it's very effective, it's very safe, and that's what we're going to be using for most of these people nowadays. So uh, if, you, if 
how much Valtrex would you use for a herpes simplex infection? Well, I think an initial one, I would, if it's the first time, I'd probably be aggressive and use like a gram uh, three times daily. Recurrent cold sores can be treated fairly well by giving them a short bolus. And so if somebody knows they've got a cold sore coming, they've got a cold sore on the lip, they feel it 48 hours before it shows up. If you were to take two tablets of Valtrex at the onset of the two, symptoms, two grams. two grams at the onset, two grams two to 12 hours later, it will abort the condition. And you can literally prevent it. And that's a very effective way of going. And that's what I typically do with my patients is I will give them a prophylactic dose and say, keep this at home. As soon as you feel the cold sore coming on, two tablets immediately, two tablets 12 hours later, they don't get the cold sore. You're changing what I'm doing. I've been doing the acyclovir mm -hmm. or the... Very effective and it's cheap. All right, and uh, so, uh, and so you, you don't give it long term. I mean, one every day as a preventative for some people who have it in the uh, genital area. You know, there are rare people who are psychologically crippled that you have to because they're so affected by the, the, the uh, the thought of having the disease that they, they just can't bear the thought that they could have it and in those rare individuals I will prophylactically treat but the huge majority of people this is a condition that comes on like a lion and goes out like a lamb and what I mean by that is if you were to have a genital herpes you might have six outbreaks the first year four outbreaks the second year two the third year and pretty soon it's once a year or less and so to have somebody on a prophylactic medication for that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, Aberdeen caller, psoriasis started taking vitamin D and it cleared up. Comment on vitamin D and psoriasis. Well, vitamin D is a good component to treat immune diseases and if you don't have the right amount of vitamin D, taking more vitamin D can help you. And we do use topical vitamin D to treat psoriasis and it's a tool that will help. And in this individual, that may have been a, a reasonable thing to do. But, you know, for everything, there's a right amount and then there's too much. And so one of the issues we're struggling with right now is uh, psoriasis is an immune modulated disease and vitamin D does affect the immune system. So, yes, some vitamin D can be helpful, but you have to be careful. There's a right amount. And so I tell people, well, ideally, if you're going to take vitamin D, 1,000 units is probably okay, but never go over 2,000 units. And you really want to talk with your doctor because if you've got a good balanced diet, you may not need this. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of I'm going to be healthy because I take buckets of vitamins, that's not the case. And if you've listened to the news recently, we know that too much vitamin can be, ben can be harmful as well. Well, I'll echo what you said about too many vitamins and the value of eating correctly, but I have to reserve a, a a little bit of dis disagreement in as much as the Institute of Medicine who has recommended lower doses, you know, 800 for the elderly, 600 mm -hmm. for the rest of us, and, and smaller for small kids, um, did say probably under 10,000 is safe, under 4,000 is safe. Uh, and so I'm okay with 2,000. I recommend 2,000, mm -hmm. and I don't think anybody is going to be harmed by 2,000. And I saw a guy who came in with gout, and I've been messing with gout medicines. It's fairly toxic and struggling with that. And oh, by the way, you know your vitamin D level, I just measured it, is really quite low. So I'm going to put you on 2,000 of vitamin D a day. And um, about a month later, I said, so that gout medicine I was prescribing, ah, oh, I threw all that away. But the problem all went away when I started the vitamin D. Mm -hmm. So, and I've seen that. So just anecdotal. We don't have the data. We do know it helps with bone strength. I think vitamin D is a great thing, but my, my uh, worry is that if you get to the point where I think you can treat everything by vitamins, you're yeah. stepping on a problem. Talk to your doctor. Yeah. You know, get their advice because these things do change, and vitamin D is one of these areas where there are some people that are very pro and there are some people that are not so pro. I think that you're right, that we're going to be using more and more of it because all of the research right now supports it as a good way to augment your, uh, to your immune system. Um, but I think you'll be surprised that not everybody's going to clear with their psoriasis by using vitamin yeah, D. But it's worth a try. It won't hurt you. And it's safe. And it's safe, 2,000. Also from Aberdeen, female collar has a very itchy scalp, but no dandruff or infection. What might relieve it? Let's talk about dandruff first. A lot of people have dandruff, and I have a patient who recently uh, ha has 
is recovering in the nursing home, and it just had a huge flare. I mean, his just his eyebrows and his mustache and beard are just flaking like I've never seen anything. It's just the seborrheic dermatitis. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've treated him with uh, uh, oral Lamisil tablets, and uh, it's not, I think I'm only doing it twice a week. I should probably do it more. Mm -hmm. what, what's your take on seborrheic dermatitis, well, the classic dandruff? Seborrheic dermatitis is one of these very common diseases that if you go to a, a book or read something, pretty soon you know as much as we dermatologists. It's a very, very common disease. 15% of the population has it. We dermatologists know about 10 cents worth of information. And so the problem is it does respond pretty well to treatment, but we really don't understand why people get it. There are probably multiple reasons, but when you think of dandruff, what you're really seeing is skin growing rapidly. Now the classic situation with seborrheic dermatitis probably represents an irritation because of bacteria or microorganisms in the scalp overgrowing. So with something like Lamisil like you're doing is a good bet to start with. One of the things I frequently see though is People assume that if I go and get my Selsun or my head and shoulders and I really shampoo vigorously, it's going to go away. Well, the problem is people don't understand that sometimes there are shampoos that are good at cleaning the scalp and then there are shampoos that heal the scalp. Selsun, head and shoulders are cleaning shampoos. They clean the scale away, they remove the dandruff, but in doing so they frequently cause irritation. So I'll tell people Sure, if you want to use Selsun, if you want to use the, the uh, uh, tar shampoos, things like, well, tar is pretty good, but some of these things are good to clean the scalp, but that's not going to resolve your problem. So then you need to move on to something else. And healing, healing up, shampoo, un which... up until recently, Nizoril was available over the counter, and recently it's been taken off. I don't know why, but that was a great shampoo because it was an antifungal, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory shampoo pretty good at taking away the irritation. Tar shampoos are very good for this and a good one like TGL or something like that are very helpful with it. But when you get down to where you're dealing with a lot of inflammation, probably the smartest thing you can do at that point is go get some hydrocortisone lotion because hydrocortisone lotion is gonna take away that inflammation that the head and shoulders and the selsun won't. And uh, Lamisil tablets, uh, you use that, uh, you know, I also can use it for people with uh, a rash on their feet, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the athlete's foot. Uh, what's the dose of that? How would you do that? Well, Lamisil comes as a 250 milligram pill, and uh, uh, 10 years ago, $300 for a month. Today, it's $4 a month. So typically, it's a drug that is very effective, it's very safe, very few side effects, and the nice part is $4 a month is a lot cheaper than that uh, topical antifungal. Yeah. So yeah. most of these things nowadays, I don't treat with topical antifungals. I use the Lamisil so orally. So for a kid who comes in with athlete's foot or a, a person who's starting to get a bad nail, do you put them on Lamisil 250 once a day, generic version, once a day for a month, two well, months? Well, if you're treating skin, 30 days will clear it. If you're cl uh, treating the fingernails, you need 60 days. If you're treating the toenails, you need 90 days. But when you treat the skin in 30 days, it's clear. But nails, you treat for 60 days, you have a medicine that stays there, and so as the fingernail grows out, it takes six months, that's all you need to do. Toenails take as long as a year to a year and a half to grow out. So you treat for 90 days, but you don't get the full benefit for a year to a year and a half. And, and sometimes it comes back anyway. Well, 70% of the time it works, 30% of the time it doesn't. Okay. Staph infection is another skin infection that Merritt Warren with the Avera Medical Group talked on about to on call. Here are his comments. Um, the other issue that we deal with that's fairly significant with athletes is um, staph infections. The, the common term for it is MRSA, which is methicillin resistant staph aureus. So it's, it's basically a skin infection with, with staph and uh, can cause quite a, a problem for athletes. It's a topical skin infection. It's usually uh, one of the common terms is impetigo. It'll be a, a crusting, um, draining kind of lesion on the skin. It can be an abscess where it forms a little pus pocket. Um, so those are all the ways that would present. Any type of topical or superficial skin infection can get infected with staph. We're seeing two different forms of MRSA. One is the hospital-acquired MRSA, which 
is much more serious. It's more resistant to the normal antibiotics that we would use. Um, Community-acquired MRSA is still sensitive generally to two, topi two typical um, more ordinary antibiotics that we can use. So it's, it's easier to treat and isn't quite as, as life-threatening as a hospital-acquired MRSA. That's the ultimate fear uh, is a major infection that just won't, cl won't clear with, with even some of the stronger antibiotics. And that's usually the hospital acquired ones. Um, the, the morbidity is, is fairly high with, with staph infections in the hospital. So you just have to be very careful not to, to let that spread. Jim, a lot of people talk about MRSA all the time. Staph infection has been with us a kajillion years. We, it, it doesn't surprise me that we've now, you know, developed resistance. And mm -hmm. so the resistance is MRSA, but it's the same staff. I mean, it seems to be, uh, pops up out of the blue. Sometimes it can be very mean. Uh, do you, or do you think it is truly this, this, this uh, tissue eating bacteria that people are afraid of? Well, that's a different story and I won't jump into that too hard, but I agree with Dr. Warren that there are two forms of this MRSA that we see, and what we see in clinical practice is a fairly benign disease, and unfortunately there are a lot of nights when there's a bad day on the news and they make it into this horrendous disease, and the reality is the MRSA that we see in the non-hospital thing is a very easy condition to treat, and a lot of it's very basic. As Dr. Warren was talking about, if they have an abscess, you gotta drain it. So you can't treat an infection that's an abscess without draining it. Uh, antibiotics are pretty good. Um, a lot of people, the antibacterial soaps are helpful. You know, get the area cleaned up. But first and foremost, abscesses have to be drained. Skin lesions can be treated with topical antibiotics if they're limited. Oral antibiotics are helpful. But the issue is community acquired MRSA is very responsive to the various, very inexpensive generic uh, antibiotics, the sulfa type drugs and the tetracycline type drugs. And so it's really not the problem that it's painted to on the media. When it's in the hospital, we have to use vancomycin. Vancomycin, and the time. stronger meds. That's yeah. a different condition. Different ballpark. So we used to, you know, cleanse it with this chlorinated treatment, and then we'd use Bactroban or topical uh, antibiotics. Do you do you use topical antibiotics with staph infections and impetigo anymore? I do. I do in some situations. Um, but I'm kind of a cheapskate, and so one of the things I will do is if it is a limited area, I will use topical antibiotics. Um, one of the ones I like to use is a very one, is one that people don't use a lot, it's gentamicin, and gentamicin is a prescription antibiotic. It's available in a cream or ointment. It's very inexpensive. You don't see a lot of reactions to it. People get allergic to neumycin, they get allergic to bacitracin, they get uh, allergic to polymyxin B. These are the over-the-counter ones, but genomycin is not in any of those, and it does not cross over. So when I get people that are allergic to those, I like to use that one. It will not get all the MRSA ones, so if they're, then you probably have to go to Bacterban. But one of my old favorites is good old-fashioned bleach. And so if I get somebody that comes in with a widespread infection, We'll use a little bit of oral antibiotics, we'll use the topicals, but frequently I go to bleach baths. And that's something that's kind of a new type of thing we're doing more and more with people. And we talk about something called atopic dermatitis. Bleach baths, so how much bleach in a, in, a, in a bath full of water? Well, typically a quarter cup of bleach in a tub of bath water will be very effective at clearing the skin of bacterial infection. And so what you do, you take the bath, get out, take a shower, because obviously you're gonna smell of the bleach water, so you can shower that off. But doing that and then applying a light moisturizer will really minimize a lot of these issues. And what you're doing is you're reducing the amount of bacteria on the surface, so you're reducing the problem for you, but you're also reducing the carrier function. All right, uh, that's great information. And uh, I, I, I make the other point that, you know, Part of that barrier of our skin is destroyed when we over clean and we over rub and we over wash. And I know people who, for example, OCD people who are into the bathroom and are washing because they're afraid of the exactly. bacteria. The problem is they're causing more uh, problem because they're breaking down their own barrier and making the infection have a chance to get in. And that's where, you know, you look at things and say, well, 
you know, everything that the teachers are talking about, using the antibacterial gels and all those things, they all have a place and they're all excellent, but if it gets to a certain point, you have to add the second factor, and that is if you're going to remove the oils, you got to replace the oil. So, yes, it's fine to go ahead and use these cleansers and everything else, but what we've done in the hospitals where I've been involved, we've got the cleaning station, we've got the moisturizer right next to it. So you use the antibiotic soap, you use the antibiotic gel or the alcohol-based product to and clean the skin, rinse it off, and then get a light, non-scented moisturizer on to restore that barrier. Let's do questions and, and respond quickly. Okay, let's see what we can do. Sturgis Caller asks, should preschoolers use hand soap versus antibacterial lotion before meals? Well, I think that's not a bad idea at all to go ahead and do that. You know, good uh, hygiene is a great time to start at that area. Um, you don't need to be overly uh, carried away for it, but I think it's a good idea. And if they're doing it a lot, you know, have a little hand lotion there. Okay, uh, but you're, uh, how about the, the, the squirter thing before they eat versus fine. hand wash? Good. I, I think those are, those are very helpful. I mean, you're not overdoing it. It's a pretty safe thing. And, you know, this is an area where there's a lot of kids coming in with things. Great way to spread to prevent those spreads. spreads. And I, I'd say if there's a respiratory infection, in most schools there is, if there's a respiratory infection, you're going to want to use that hand. If you there's bet. a back di diarrhea illness, then you're going to want to wash your hands with soap and water. Vermilion Caller wants to know about seborrheic keratosis. Is it inherited? How do you control it? And we just address it. I think well, that's seborrheic dermatitis. They're talking about a growth. Oh, yeah, seborrheic um, keratosis. You're right. Yeah. And seborrheic keratosis is a condition where you simply get little growths on the skin, and they're, they're not inherited. They're related to a hormone from the bowel called epidermal growth factor, and about 88% of us get it. And it's more of an aging phenomenon than anything else, and that is that if you get old enough, the average person is going to have a few of these benign growths on the skin. They are not precancerous, they're not dangerous, but they can be irritated, and doctors will treat them when and if there's an indication, but in general, they're benign and they don't require treatment. And we don't know what, what brings them on. Well, other than the epidermal growth factor, that's about it. Okay. You will rarely see it if people have bowel cancers, and so if the you're... The sign of... Look, the, the lesser lesser trillet, yeah. Yes. Uh, there are rare cases where people develop thousands over a period of a couple of weeks. Well, that's a different story. There you go to your doctor. Suddenly, you're breaking out with these SEBs. You need to come in and be worked up. Yeah. Woodstock, Minnesota caller, her granddaughter has a hemangioma in the inner corner of her eye. In other words, a little blood vessel growth. She is two years old and hasn't, it hasn't gone away. Should they have it removed? Well, that's a pretty good answer in that hemangiomas occur in like one half percent of all the kids that are born and sometimes up to four percent. In a typical situation, hemangiomas grow for the first year of life and they tend to involute spontaneously before age six. So the answer in this case is if the lesion is asymptomatic, it's not creating problems and the child isn't having issues, you can leave it. If it is symptomatic, if it's uh, creating problems with vision or things like that, then people like myself, dermatologists or plastic surgeons use lasers to take them away. But the newest thing is that propranolol has been very effective as an oral medication in treating some of these hemangioma complexes. And especially when they're growing rapidly, uh, giving oral uh, propranolol can the actually old, reverse that. The old beta blockers. Yeah. Kids. Uh, but again, this is a drug that needs to be used, especially a two-year-old with the, with the pediatrician because every drug has side effects. And so... Uh, when I see something like this and that drug is indicated, I do it with the pediatrician because they need to be monitored. Under a year of age or under six weeks or six months of age, they almost have to be hospitalized. Uh, at two years, could be under the care of either the pediatrician or the primary doctor. So a kid comes in, he's a born uh, two, two weeks ago, he's got a big facial red birthmark of some mm -hmm. kind. Do you leave those alone, or do you treat them with your laser? I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, um, not, it's not pretty. Fifteen years ago, I would have lasered them. Today, I would put them on propranolol uh, pretty much immediately uh, with the assistance of the primary doctor because we've seen that uh, putting them on pro propranolol, within two weeks, they'll stop growing, and you can see a very dramatic involution in these areas. Gee. And the issue is, while they might go away by age six, think about it, you've got all these ugly pictures from age six months till six years where they don't have to have that birthmark. So I'm, I'm a little more proactive nowadays. I like to use propranolol. All right. 
Well, we're going to talk about skin infections with Merritt Warren once again uh, when he talked about ringworm. Here's his comments. The other issue that we see with athletes is ringworm. That's, you know, unfortunately just a fairly common situation. Uh, it's a topical infection treated very easily with topical um, antifungals. Occasionally we have to use oral antifungals to treat them, but again, it's contagious, usually direct skin-to-skin -skin contact, so we have to be careful with that. It's just, yeah, heat and moisture let the fungus grow, you know, whether it's, whether it's um, athlete's foot or, or jock itch or the tinea corporis, which is the ringworm on the body. They're all essentially related to the same fungal infection. It's just where it is on the body. Well, that's the classic ringworm. It's just a, it's a circular lesion with a raised leading edge and a central clearing. So it's a pretty, pretty easily recognized once you're aware of what you're looking for. Yeah, it's, it's going to itch a little bit, but other than that, it's not going to be anything that's going to be particularly uncomfortable. Yeah, ringworm, not a worm at all, but a fungus. And it invades, uh, and you see it in wrestlers, uh, and your experience has been... It, you know, it's, it's a type of thing where this is something where the earlier speakers really hit it on the head. A lot of this can be prevented by good care of the mats and the facilities, and the, the trainer talked about that, and that's very appropriate. Also appropriate is for the coach and the doctors that are involved with these kids, identify these kids before the match. If they've got an active infection, they shouldn't wrestle. Um, and if they do wrestle, they can infect every kid in the place, and that can be a nightmare. And, and I told you previously about some cases where one, inf one wrestler infected can spread that onto the mat and several other people can get it and it can be a real difficult thing. So you would say the same story, the $4 a month Lamisil tablet. That's, that's the way to go. Uh, topical treatment of antifungals, the problem is you're treating what you see and you may not be treating the whole process. And a topical antifungal can be 60 to $80 for one little tube and you might go through three tubes whereas one month of oral Lamisil is $4. And it's a very safe, very benign drug, so that's, it, that's the way I go. If it doesn't work, you go Diflucan? Uh, Old-fashioned Griseofulvin, usually. And, uh, but the issue is Griseofulvin is effective, but you gotta go to like double the dose. And so once you start using Griseofulvin, you're starting to deal with side effects like hepatotoxicity and mm -hmm. headaches and things. And so that's a little less fun to use, but uh, if you've got bad ones, that's what we do. All right, uh, how about warts in the, these people? Well, warts are an issue in that uh, generally, like with wrestlers and sports activities, what I'll tell those people is if you, can, if you have to wrestle and you don't have them treated, you need to cover them up. And so what I will do, like especially in wrestling tournaments, I'll put some kind of an occlusive dressing over them so that they're not that's gonna expose it. them and then they can wrestle. And that's what the national uh, NCCA recommends. Are you freezing them with, uh, with uh, cryotherapy and getting rid of them. You know, when you're a doctor and you're asked to treat them, you look for what's the simplest treatment. So it's always cryotherapy initially. Um, I don't get the simple ones, so a lot of times I have to treat them with lasers. But what's come on the market recently is the newer, stronger uh, salicylates. And so the old-fashioned over-the-counter salicylates were 12 to 16 percent, and they were a little bit effective, but not very effective. The newest thing now is a 27% uh, topical salicylate, which is extremely effective, and it, it's something your doctor can prescribe, and I found that that's really helpful for a lot of them, and that's what we do with most of them now. All right, we're, we're just about out of time. You know, 30 seconds, any major issues that you wanna make sure people remember today? Well, I think the, the you know, when we've looked about things, we talk about personal responsibility, and so, um, hand washing is good because if you wash your hands and you're not exposing other people to your bacteria, that's a good. In terms of protecting yourself, you need a barrier function. So wash your hands, use a light moisturizer, and it doesn't have to smell good. That's the, that's the biggest problem is people think that I've got to use this really fabulous smelling problem and that's not really helping anything. Light moisturizer, unscented, that's the best way to go. And you're recommending sun tanning booths? Well, tanning booths are really good because if you get a lot of tanning, you're going to get cancer, and then you're going to make me rich. Oh, there you go. So, well, I want you to know that it's a, it's a great pleasure to have you here, Jim. It's great to be back, Rick. Thanks, so Thanks for having me. Thank you, and be healthy, people.
like every kid, I struggled with acne as a teenager, but then as adulthood came upon me, the pimples and red face seemed to finally clear up. Sometimes, though, after 30 years of age, it comes back. This time, acne is called rosacea, or adult acne, which is a bit different than the teenage type. Rosacea can result in visible blood vessels, pimples, and thickening of the skin, especially on and around the nose. Everyone remembers somebody with a large, red, bulbous nose. The reason why people get rosacea is not as yet completely understood, but we understand several of the causes. In some, it can be related to flushing, which is exaggerated blood vessel dilation from exposure to environmental factors, such as the sun or the cold, alcohol drinks, or even spicy foods. Research has indicated that certain types of bacterial overgrowth of the intestines may even have something to do with it and skin mites that grow in hair and oil follicles, little bugs, can result in rosacea, especially in the elderly and especially on the eyelids. Different than teenage pimple inflamed acne, rosacea is more related to and worsened by flushing. Different than seborrheic dermatitis, which causes flaking dandruff from the scalp and the eyebrows and the nose creases, rosacea doesn't cause dandruff. Different than immune system diseases like the red mask of lupus, rosacea is not dangerous, doesn't involve multiple body systems. Well, several of the treatments for juvenile acne seem also to work for rosacea. This includes a topical or uh, smeared on products like metronidazole, as well as a, a pill taken uh, antibiotic like doxycycline. There's also laser therapy, which can reduce dilated blood vessels and trim down that bulbous swelling of the nose. Famous people who have struggled with this adult acne condition include Rosie O'Donnell, Bill Clinton, Mariah Carey, and an old one, W.C. Fields. But you don't have to be famous to have it since something like 16 million Americans are presently diagnosed with rosacea. And you don't have to go to the Hollywood to get treatment either because help is as close as your doctor's office. That guy goes on and on. You know, it's terrible. <laughs> so what do, you, um, what do you think about uh, rosacea? I talked about using uh, a topical antibiotic and uh, also Retin-A. I think when you look at things, you're going to find that uh, topical antibiotics are helpful. Oral antibiotics are very helpful with some people. When you, when you look at rosacea, you split it up into, is it papules, is it erythema or redness, or is it involvement of the eyes? If you just have the papules, topical creams are excellent. Metronidazole, sulfotype drugs, uh, clindamycin, things, all very helpful. Um, if you've got a lot of inflammation, if you've got a lot of blepharitis, which is the soreness around the eye, you're gonna have to treat with an oral antibiotic. Another unknown factor with rosacea is that Rosacea people's skin is very sensitive. So the first thing I always tell people with rosacea is you can't use soap. You are to use a cleanser. And so I sit them down and say, Dove is not soap. You can use that. You can use any kind of over-the-counter cleanser. If you see something pretty in the store, use that. Cleansers clean. They don't take the oil away. Next factor is you need to use a light moisturizer. And there are lots of these light moisturizers. Uh, Purpose lotion, Cetaphil lotion, CeraVe lotion, Oil of Olay, Neutrogena products, all very light, elegant products that can be used to create a light barrier. Get the skin damp, put a light barrier on. A big part of rosacea is irritation. So if you're doing that, you'll help. And then if you're using uh, sunscreens during the summer, it makes a difference because rosacea does flare with sunlight in the summer. Okay. And so that's adult acne. How do you, I, ma I, I imagine that a lot of your businesses is kids acne that's different that's the fun part teenagers present to us with acne and you look at it and say well here comes this horrible looking kid well this is an opportunity for us to prevent that childhood disaster and acne is all about hormones and when the child starts to go into menopause or uh, not menopause but puberty when they start to have those puberty effects, the hormones come on, the body's starting to increase the hormone levels, and that goes into the oil glands and stimulates excess oil production. There's bacteria, the oil plus bacteria causes acne. 
antibiotics topically, oral antibiotics, and topical retinoids are really major benefits in this day. So the uh, there's no over-the-counter antibiotics. You need to get a type of antibiotic. From well, over-the-counter benzoyl peroxide is a great way to start, and I always tell people if you got a lot of basic papules, you'll start out with a gentle cleanser. Go to your pharmacist, ask them about an over-the-counter benzoyl peroxide product because they are helpful with mild acne and they're inexpensive and you don't have to buy the TV product. All right, and, and then uh, Retin-A, Retin-A, Retin-A. Retin-A, you got to see your, your primary doctor for that. All right, boy, we had a lot of information here. Thanks so much, Jim. Oh, thank you, Rick. And I'll say it again, people, stay healthy out there. And we're off the air, <laughs> and I think that went... Funding for this program is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System. Regional Health, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Post captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. To learn more about life and health, you can order your copy of The Picture of Health, a beautiful book containing insightful essays and evocative images by on-call medical editor Dr. Rick Holm and Dr. Judith Peterson. This book, containing health care advice, stories of medical history, and meditations on healing, can now be yours for $17 at the South Dakota Ag Heritage Museum. Call 1-877-227-0015 to order.